Hi, I'm Stuart. I come from a background in regional MMA and other contact sports, some of which you can see here. Education-wise, I have a degree in medical science from the University of Birmingham, UK. It overlaps with elements of sports science, and I've done further research on this issue, some of which I will reference later in the video. So I'm going to go through the issue of which energy system is primarily used in striking sports such as boxing, kickboxing, karate kumite, the striking aspect of MMA. I think there's a myth that goes around a lot that primarily the anaerobic system is the main energy system that is used. In recent years there's been some good research done which suggests that actually the aerobic energy system is the primary energy system used in these sports. So before going through an overview of the energy systems and what the research on this issue shows, one thing that I'd like to briefly address in this video is the issue of stress fatigue, you could call it an adrenaline dump, and in some cases, disrupted breathing patterns. One thing I will say is that whilst this is a big issue in combat sports and it affects both competitors, in some cases it can affect one competitor more than another. In some cases I think this is used as a crux to kind of explain why somebody gassed when in reality they might have tailored their training towards the wrong energy system and rather than looking at maybe say breathing exercises or something along these lines to sort out their conditioning issues, if they had tailored their training towards the appropriate energy system the one that's going to be used more in the combat sport, this might have resulted in them having better endurance. So the first energy system that the body uses is the anaerobic alactic system, also known as the creatine phosphate system. This energy system gets its name from anaerobic, which means without oxygen, or alactic, which means without the buildup of alactic acid. So this energy system allows you to do very explosive actions without causing the buildup of lactic acids, which can be quite damaging to the muscle over longer duration activities, which is something which I'll get into later in this video. So this energy system can last for around six to 10 seconds. It achieves partial recovery quite quickly. In around 30 seconds, it can recover to about 50% capacity but to achieve full recovery for it, it takes longer around sort of five to 10 minutes. In terms of training this energy system it is the least well understood of the three energy systems. There is some evidence showing that 400 meters runners, for instance, have a better alactic capacity than marathon runners, mainly because the 400 meters is quite an explosive event and you're really using this sort of explosive capabilities. Whereas in the marathon, you will use the anaerobic electric system a tiny amount, as I mentioned, but generally, because it's quite sort of constant and steady state, you're not really generally going to be using it. But in terms of 5K runners, there is evidence that 400 meters runners actually have the same anaerobic electric capacity as the 5k runners so that kind of shows you know you wouldn't really think of a 5k run as being a hugely anaerobic alactic event so it kind of implies you can train it a little bit but not really that much the next energy system which the body uses is the anaerobic lactic system this energy system as the name implies causes the build-up of lactic acid this energy system is generally used in longer duration sprints where the energy demands exceeds those which can be provided by the aerobic system on its own and the anaerobic alactic system has been burnt out. Unlike the anaerobic alactic system which responded quite poorly to training, it could be improved a moderate amount but not really much the anaerobic lactic system can be increased quite a large amount with training. George Brooks is one of the world's leading researchers in terms of uh, lactic acid and he estimates that the anaerobic lactic capacity can be doubled with training. 
so one thing to be wary of with this energy system is that it can take quite a long time to recover up to an hour and as it does cause the build up of the lactic acids that can be quite damaging to the muscle the next energy system that the body uses is the aerobic system like that anaerobic lactic system this energy system responds quite well to training it is believed that the energy this system can contribute can be over doubled with training however one thing that i will get into about the aerobic system later in the video is that because it's already so powerful that if you can do a multiplier on it then you're going to get more bang for your buck than you would with the anaerobic lactic system simply because if you do a multiplier of 36 say one and a half times 36 then that's going to be a greater number than one and a half times two because the anaerobic lactic system is generally quite weak so to get into some specific data there is a paper which i will leave a link to in the description titled the energetics of semi-contact three by two minute amateur boxing that researched the energy demands of this bowel format. This paper was written by Phil Davis, a researcher out of the University of Essex, collaborating with researchers out of Germany. They estimated that the total energy contributions were 77% aerobic, 19% anaerobic lactic, and 4% anaerobic lactic. So when you hear people claim that the anaerobic lactic system is the main supplier of energy in striking sports, I would bear in mind that this energy system is only contributing 4% of the total energy in this model. So taking a quote from the conclusion to this study, the authors note that energy demands of boxing are clearly predominantly aerobic. So the first question you may have is can we trust this study and the method used? I think this study is trustworthy for the purposes of an estimation. As I said, I will leave a link in the description for you to decide for yourself, but to go over the methods briefly. So the study authors note, probably the most accurate method of examining the energy demands of a sport is to use a spirometer to measure the volume and composition of inspired and expired gases. However, as the study authors mention, the obvious problem with using a spirometry device is that if a boxer gets punched, it could damage the device and potentially the person wearing it if it shatters. The study authors therefore decide that the best way to assess the energy demands are by using the spirometry device and by using a simulation of an actual boxing bout. At this point in the video, you might be cringing slightly at the prospect of a simulation thinking that a simulation will in no way recreate the intensity of an actual boxing bout. In my opinion, the authors make a pretty good case that their simulation is effective. The simulation consisted of the subjects performing a semi-contact bout against handheld pads, recreated from previously analysed video footage of competitive bouts. Although the subjects were not in a competitive bout reacting to real attacking movements, they were made to perform defensive movements against the coach throwing punches with the pads. In addition to the semi-contact simulation involving the coach, the testing also included an incremental treadmill run to exhaustion. The authors note that the simulation resulted in a maximal oxygen consumption that was 97% of the maximal oxygen consumption achieved during the treadmill, and likely 97% of the maximal oxygen consumption that would be achieved during a real bout. So we can say that the study participants were likely working very hard during the simulation with a pattern of activity that would be comparable in intensity to a full amateur boxing bout and with similar movement patterns. The research into high level athletes is limited in sports science in general. However, the reports in the media from boxers seem to suggest that they do a large volume of steady state cardio. If you look at Floyd Mayweather as an athlete in probably the most competitive striking sport in the world, Here's what he has to say about his training. I run between, it varies, five to, five to seven miles, five to eight miles. So to move on to a study investigating the energetics of karate kumite, the authors note that although it was previously hypothesized that the anaerobic system was the primary energy contributor, it had never been investigated. To go over the study, they analysed 10 male nationally ranked karateka who competed at the national championships. 
the study found that contrary to previously published hypotheses slash ideas, they found that the aerobic system was the primary energy contributor. Looking at a review article, looking at repeated sprints, we see the same pattern of activity. The anaerobic, alactic or creatine phosphate system is used almost exclusively in the first sprint and the aerobic system is used almost exclusively during the recovery between sprints, with it also being used more in the later sprints. So, so far we have looked at information from karate, boxing and repeat sprints and found that the primary energy contributors are the anaerobic galactic system and the aerobic system. Next to look at information from a more sustained event such as the 400 meters. When looking at information from 400 meters runners, we see they achieve blood lactic acid concentrations of 20.8 millimoles per litre. Whereas in boxing, they achieve post-bout lactic acid concentrations of 9.5 millimoles per litre. So it's apparent that the anaerobic lactic system is generally used significantly more in the 400 metres than in a typical amateur boxing bout. This of course depends on the style the competitor uses. So this was something that I alluded to earlier. There is the process of glycolysis which occurs outside the cell in both aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. This process yields two molecules of ATP, which is the final energy source, and for anaerobic metabolism, that is as far as it goes. If oxygen is present, which it will be for a large amount of the time during a striking sport, the breakdown products of glycolysis will enter the cell and mitochondria where they will go through the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So these processes produce an extra 36 molecules of ATP. So as you can see, the aerobic system is vastly more powerful than the anaerobic system. Referring back to the boxing study by Phil Davis, he notes that it would be illogical to think that the anaerobic system could provide enough energy for an amateur boxing bout. So moving on to a review looking at high intensity interval training. The authors note that after reviewing several studies, the best cardiopulmonary adaptions were elicited by spending around 10 minutes at your VO2 max. So to put that into practical terms, as a baseline test, your VO2 max pays is the pace that you can sustain for eight minutes. So if you run an eight minute mile, then that is your VO2 max pace, and the same applies with cycling and swimming, whatever the mode of exercise may be. The authors note that intervals with a work to rest ratio greater than one are useful for optimizing the time at VO2 max to exercise time ratio, whilst the use of intervals themselves are useful for optimizing your time at VO2 max as otherwise you would only be able to spend around 8 minutes at VO2 max, not the 10 minutes that are cited as ideal. They note that shortening of the recovery interval will generally cause more anaerobic development, whilst longer intervals and active rest, such as jogging for 2 minutes between a longer 4 minute high intensity interval, will cause more aerobic development. High intensity interval training is very useful for combat sports athletes for developing endurance in the fast twitch muscle fibres. However, in many cases, it would appear that the fighters are getting this from sparring rather than supplementary training. Sparring at Mike's gym in Holland is known to be pretty full on. Freddie Roach has said that the only thing they don't do at Wildcard Gym is finish their sparring partners off. There are plenty of clips of Floyd Mayweather sparring full on as well. Meanwhile, in Thailand, they do spar quite light. So it's really an athlete's discretion as to whether or not they want to do supplementary high intensity interval training or get all of the HIIT from the combat sports training. Meanwhile, the steady state cardio provides a way of improving the aerobic system whilst also being quite gentle on the body. Finally, if you have found this video useful, then you may like my video on the issue of whether or not weight training slows strikers down, looking at things from the perspective of muscle fiber type. And forthcoming on my channel will be a video looking at the issue of slow speed versus high velocity strength training in terms of both muscle physiology and factoring in the nervous system.